Um, and we're going to today spend some time building up another way to, to look at complex numbers. And we, we talked about this a little bit already. Um, every, how every, every complex number has a real and imaginary part, which we can really think of as coordinates on what we call the complex plane. So you take a real number, like the real number line that we know and love, that's our horizontal axis, and then at a right angle we draw another axis. So we think of this as like an xy plane, only now it's a real by the imaginary, right? So we put, we have our j axis or our imaginary axis. And every number has precisely one spot on the plane. And each spot on the plane it corresponds with precisely one complex number. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So 2 plus 3j is this number. Now, when we think about plotting a point on the plane and how we define this number is just to be at that location, um, it may not be surprising that we can use this to build this other kind of whole concept, this other way of thinking about complex numbers, which is that number, 2 plus 3j, can also be defined by being a particular distance from the origin, right, like the length of that blue line, at a particular angle. Right, so I'll call the length of this blue line, I'll call that r. So each complex number has a magnitude, which is the length, r, and a direction, which is that angle. That means that the complex numbers, each complex number can be thought of as a vector. And in fact, the complex numbers are, we would say, a two-dimensional vector space over the real numbers. Um, and that's really what we're doing in, uh, for the next few sections, really working with complex numbers by thinking of them as vectors. Um, So if we were adding them graphically, and, and by the way, we already have a great way to add complex numbers, but I, I'm just going to sort of demonstrate one way in which they are, just like vectors. When we add vectors graphically, we add them tip to tail. So if I were to, to, um, to find the sum 5 minus 2j plus negative 2 minus j, well, 5 minus 2j, here's 5 minus 2j. Oh, positive 5 on the real axis, negative 2j on the imaginary, and then negative 2 minus j is right here. When we add them tip to tail, we say, okay, let's traverse one vector. And just for, you know, it doesn't matter which one we pick. So let's say if we start with the 5 minus 2j vector. So I'm going to sort of traverse, get myself to the end of that vector, and then I'm going to take this vector as is. I'm not going to rotate it or spin it around or change its length. I'm just sliding it so it starts at the end here and redrawing it so that it starts from the end of 5 minus 2j. And this would look like this. Uh, off a little bit. That would look like this. Right, so that's like parallel to this one, just sort of starts at the end of the 5 minus 2j vector. And then the sum would be the vector that starts at the origin and ends right here. So I would just think of it as the vector that ends, let's see, what's the real part there? 3 and the imaginary part is minus 3j. Okay. My brother is doing this and gets slow. Okay. So when you're adding complex numbers, if you were given if you were given a problem that's like add these complex numbers, nobody would ever be like, okay, let me draw and then draw a vector and then go here. We because we already have a faster, better way to add complex numbers. In fact, if I said add the complex numbers up here and we didn't and we weren't talking about the visual representation. Um, we would just add the real parts, right? 5 plus negative 2, and then add the imaginary parts. Negative 2, uh, negative 2j plus negative j, and that would give us 3 minus 3j. Like, we already know how to find the sum. 
Um, so what we'll observe here is that it is at least consistent with our um, thinking about them as vectors and how we add vectors tip to tail. We don't even add, I mean, when we're adding vectors, by the way, we don't even, we don't even do this out, right? Like we, have, we say, let's find the components, we'll add the two x components, we'll find, the, you know, the, we'll add the two y components, and that's exactly what we do when we find the two reals, right? Add the two real parts and add the two imaginary parts. This thinking of complex numbers as vectors will come in incredibly handy, I promise. We're going to be able to do amazing things that we would never be able to do um, with the rectangular form. Uh, first, we need a, a, a nice way, we need to sort of build up our notation and get a little practice on how we write these out. When we write a complex number like it's a vector by finding a magnitude and direction, we say that we're finding its polar form. Um, and a quick notation, like vocabulary thing, our textbook, in its, in its less than infinite wisdom, um, distinguishes between the two polar forms, and it calls one of them polar form and the other one exponential form. In reality, they're both a polar form. We just have one of them as a trigonometric polar form, and the other one's an exponential polar form. Um, so let's work on building up our uh, technique for finding for finding these polar forms. So I have a complex number. I just, for, for no reason in particular, put it in the first quadrant. But what we're going to, our technique we're going to build will work regardless of where this number is. We want to find its polar form. That means I'm going to view it as a vector. If I want the polar form, I want to find the magnitude, which I'll call r, and I want to find the direction, which I'll call theta. We have been doing, looking at vectors like this since way back at the beginning of pre-calc 1. Um, we do our favorite thing to do in a, uh, in a coordinate plane, and that is we drop down a perpendicular. When we do that, the length along the bottom is x. This length is y. So if I know um, the real and imaginary parts, certainly we can find a way to find um, the magnitude and direction. What I want to do right now is say, OK, if I have, um, let's see. Uh, so I'm going to build up a couple of things. We're going to go in both directions. So let's start with this. Let's start with this right triangle that we have, and let's use Sokotoa. Let's notice that cosine theta. If I use Sokotoa with that triangle, what is cosine theta equal to? Yeah, x over r, adjacent over hypotenuse. And that means that x is r cosine theta. And if we use the sine function, opposite over hypotenuse gives us y over r. So y is equal to r sine theta. Now, if I want to express x plus yj, right, that complex number, using the magnitude and the direction. Well, I've, now I've expressed x using magnitude and direction and y using magnitude and direction. So let's put this together. This is r cosine theta plus r sine theta times j. And it'll, you know, we can actually factor out the, the r and we get r times cosine theta plus, and I'm going to put the j in front, j sine theta, just so it doesn't look like the j is inside the sine function. This is writing the number in a polar form. We have expressed the sort of coordinate or rectangular form as in, in a way that uses only the magnitude r and the direction theta. Um, we use Nothing, we needed nothing other than Sokotoa 
to, to make this happen. Um, and uh, just a bit of notation here. Um, we could also write this as r at an angle theta, just like we do with vectors. Um, and we could also, here's a new notation. You might see this, depending on what book you look in, you probably won't see it in, in our book, but if you like found it on a resource, r cis theta is pretty common. Um, this cis part means cosine, cosine i sine. It's uh, comes from the fact that in most mathematics books we use i instead of j to represent the imaginary unit. So we know how to find, if we could find r and theta, we know how to write it in a polar form, right? Just express it as a vector. So um, the magnitude, when in the context of complex numbers, you can call it a magnitude, and I would know, and everybody would know exactly what you're talking about. Um, but in the context of complex numbers, we also call it a modulus of the number, or it is also equal to the absolute value. Makes sense that we call it absolute value and that it's a distance from zero. Theta is also called the argument, so if you see that word, like, I don't, you know, I don't give vocab quizzes, but if you see that word, you should know what it means. So we're going to spend a little bit of time starting with rectangular form and finding a polar form. Um, that means we're going to start off, like, think back to our vectors. We're going to start off with saying, all right, if you have the components, can you find magnitude and direction? This will be just like that. There will be almost no difference. It's just the context is that we're working with complex numbers. So I hope this will be at least a little bit familiar. Just be careful here when we're finding an angle. If it's not in the first quadrant, we have to make sure we find the reference angle and then make the adjustment for what quadrant it's in. Ready? Yes, all right. OK. This is going to be great, you guys. Uh, so we start off, here's what I always do first, all right? I, I make, here's a little tiny complex plane. I usually don't make it much bigger than that. And then I graph this line. What, and by graphing it, I really just mean the roughest sketch in that I just want a visual of what quadrant it's in. 3 plus 4j, see how like I'm not even being accurate, but that's my visual reminder to myself, this is in quadrant one, so I know that it's gonna be an acute angle. And then we have a little bit more to do. So uh, we, need to, we need to do two things. We've got to find r, we've got to find theta. So let's find r first. How do you suppose we find r? Maybe we'll go back to the previous page. If I know the values of x and y, how do you suppose we find r? Yeah. Right, so we know r should be the square root of x squared plus y squared. And how and while we're here at this page, how do you think we would find theta? Inverse time. Mm-hmm. Okay. So theta, and I'll call it um, the theta reference or alpha or whatever you want to call it, but this is arctan of y over x and it's and we always use positives. Right? So there's our there's our reference angle, and then sometimes we have to make adjustments. Okay, so r is the square root of x squared plus y squared, and this is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. Here's This part is very important. y is the imaginary part, meaning it's just the coefficient on j. It doesn't include j itself. Right? So, and that's really important because if, if you included the j and you squared it, obviously you'd get a negative, right? Because j squared is a negative one. So it's really just the coefficient squared. That'll always be a positive. It, it should be longer than either of those. It's just the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Um, and we get five. And then we find theta. This is in uh, quadrant one, I know, because I did a little sketch over here right at the beginning. So theta. I don't need to make any adjustments, it's just arctan of y over x. And we always put in positives, but our y and x are positives anyway. Arctan of 4 over 3 
which is make sure well you could be in in radian mode if you want um, just you know be consistent I'm gonna be in uh, uh, my calculators in degree mode so I'm gonna use degrees we get 53.1 degrees so what we would say now just to finish writing out our answer is that 3 plus 4j is equal to we could write it in one of three ways we could say it's 5 cosine 53.1 degrees plus j sine 53.1 degrees we could say it's 5 sis uh, 53.1 degrees or we could say it's 5 at an angle 53.1 degrees like this either is fine for obvious reasons you'll see a lot of people choose to write it in one of these ways just because it's shorter and easier but always remember the long form because sometimes we might want to go the other way like if we say oh if I have 5 at 53.1 degrees what is that as a um, in a rectangular form the way I would do that is say oh yeah well that means I have this number and then all I have to do is distribute and multiply another oh yeah, oh, yeah. all right so this is, we're writing numbers in polar form. In, in particular, when we use this cosine plus j sine form, we call it a trigonometric form, but it is still just polar form. But if you see trigonometric form, it really means in this way. So uh, I've got negative 2.08 minus 3.12j. So the first thing I do, I sketch it. Minus 2.08 minus 3.12j be like this or something like that, right? Quadrant 3. So I'm just going to keep that in mind. That'll be important when we're finding the angle. So let's find R. So the square root of the sum of the squares We're always plugging in real numbers in for x and y, so you will always get a real positive result for r. I get, let's see, 3.75. Can anybody confirm? Yeah, OK. So we know r. Now let's find theta. It's in quadrant three. If it's in quadrant three, then when we find theta, we're going to do 180 plus the reference angle. So 180 plus arctan of, and then we have the y over the x inside, but of course they got to be positive. So 3.12 divided by 2.08. I get 236.3 degrees. So now we finish it up by saying our complex number 2.08 minus 3.12j is equal to 3.75 uh, magnitude at an angle of 236.3 degrees. Or you could write it out the long way or use the cis, you know, format. When you when you write it, do you have to write the negative 2.0 minus 2.12j, or can you just write what's on the right side there? Oh, well, I mean, if you're, um, it's okay just to write it on the right side, like what's on the right side, like that's, because that is specifically what you're being asked to do, so if you put that in a box, I think it's, okay. you're, that, it should be understood that, that what you're putting in the box is the, the answer to the question that was asked. So going from rectangular to polar form takes a little bit of work. But nothing that we haven't done like a million times before, right, when we've done all of our work with vectors. Um, going the other way, 
is like super easy. All we have to do is uh, distribute. So um, 2.5 uh, cosine 315 plus j sine 315. Um, so we're just going to take this factor of 2.5, distribute it, two point five sine three fifteen degrees, and then I'll tack on the J at the end. So this is sort of like um, clearly, we could see what we need to do just by distributing. Like, we could sort of see it algebraically or arithmetically. But you can also just think of this as they're telling me the magnitude and direction of a vector. So we know that we get the x component, or the real component, by taking magnitude times cosine. We get the y component, or the imaginary component, by taking magnitude times sine. Um, so 2.5 times cosine of 315. 1.77. 1.77, yeah. And this one will be uh, minus 1.77? Yep. Minus, so it will be minus 1.77j. There it is in rectangular form. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. Do you love it? How could you know? Okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Just tell me you do. I mean, right? Okay, nice. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they could be really easy. So if a number is on the, if, if we just have a real number, right? So it's on the real number line. There's no imaginary part. It's either going to be zero degrees or 180 degrees. Um, and likewise, if it's purely imaginary, meaning it's on the imaginary, like the vertical axis, there's no real part, it's either going to be at the 90 or the 270. Um, <laughs> so sometimes we don't have to do too much work to find the polar or rectangular forms. So for example, the, here they gave us numbers in uh, rectangular form, the number 5. This is 5 plus 0j, there's no imaginary part. So this has a magnitude of 5, because that's how far away it is. And what's its angle? Zero degrees. Zero degrees. And minus 3j, well that's down here. What's its magnitude? Nope. Nope. How far away is it? Three. Three. And what's the angle? 270. 270. The magnitude is always a positive real number. Ready for more? Mm -hmm. Okay. Amazing fact. Um, this exponential form, first of all, just e, this number e, we've seen before, we've seen it in, in pre-calc 1, I know, it's the, um, it's Euler's number, it's about, you know, 2.718, not, not that that's super important to know, but it's a number kind of like pi, it is, um, uh, it's irrational transcendental, so we just represent it with the symbol e. Um, when, all we, when we did all the stuff with logs, we had like the natural log. The natural log is a log base E. Uh, so we've, we've encountered this number before, but here's the really amazing fact, is that E, uh, R E to the J theta, is another polar form. The fact that these two things are equal is absolutely astounding. Um, R times e to the j theta is equal to R times cosine theta plus j sine theta. It gives us another alternative polar form for writing these two numbers. Now here's an important part, important piece here, is that theta needs to be in radians when we write it this way. I mean, we're raising e to a power, so it kind of doesn't make much sense to raise e to like 15 degrees, um, whereas radians kind of have the same sense of size and magnitude that regular numbers do. Um, 
So we call this the exponential form, but it's just it's also a polar form. Trigonometric and exponential form, they're all polar forms, and which is to say they define a number based on its magnitude r and its direction theta. That's all polar form means. Um, so if we want to find um, so if we want to find the exponential form here, I want to be able to write it as you know r times e to the j theta. So I want to find r and I want to find theta. Well, from another example that we just did a little while ago, you could you could do this calculation again. Um, but what example was that? Oh, seven sixteen. we know that r is equal to 5 and so the only thing we need to do is find theta because we found theta in degrees before so let's just find it in radian so I'm going to switch my calculator to radian mode and find arctan of 4 over 3 Point nine two seven about. So what that means is that three plus four j is five times e to the point nine two seven j. That's an amazing thing. Are we psyched? You guys can't even stand it. <laughs> you have to sit, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I'm really glad you're sitting down for this one because here they give us a number in trigonometric form. They want it in exponential form. So they've actually already done a lot of the work for us. I mean, they're both, trigonometric and exponential are two sides of the same coin. We're defining a number but based on the r and the theta. They gave us both r and theta here. The only thing is that in exponential form, we have to have theta in radians. So the only work for us to do is to convert this angle to uh, radians. Who remembers how to do that? We have 136.3 degrees. How do we get that to radians? Times pi by 1. Yeah, yeah. So we put this over 1, and then we know that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. Um, so let's see. 136.3 times pi divided by 180, 2.34, no, 2.38. And that's all. So they, they gave us the value of r already. So we have 8.5e to the 2.38j. Um, questions uh, before I jump ahead. Questions on what we've done so far? Okay. All right. Let's do another. Here they gave us the number in um, rectangular form, and it's not one that we did before, so I think we have to do all the work for this one. We've got to find magnitude and direction. So let's find R. Oh, what quadrant is this number in? Yeah, because the real part is positive and the imaginary part is negative. So it's in quadrant 4. So we find R. It's the square root of the sum of the squares. 3.07 squared plus negative 7.43 squared. I get 8.04. Anybody else confirm? Confirmed. Confirmed. 
Now we find theta. How do we get theta? You're very close. We're going to write this in exponential form, though. 2 pi, yeah. So since we're in quadrant, we are in quadrant 4, and if we were using degrees, it would be 360 minus, uh, but we're in radian, so our calculator should be in radian mode. So theta is now 2 pi minus arctan of 7.43 over 3.07. So I get 5.104. All right, so that means that this number, 3.07 minus 7.43j, is equal to 8.04 times e raised to the 5.104j. Okay. All right. Want to keep going? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan's like, I'm yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so here they give us uh, the number in exponential form. I can see. Boy, I only just noticed right now that the projector is kind of askew, like way up. Anyway, um, so they gave us a number in exponential form. I have 2e to the 4.8j. That means they gave us r, they gave us theta in radians. When you're writing it in trigonometric form, there's nothing that says you have to be in degrees. So if I wanted to write this in trigonometric form, I could say, well, it's 2 cosine 4.8 plus j sine 4.8. Just don't put a degree symbol on there because these are radians. I could leave it just like that or write it, you know, in the shorthand form. That's okay. You can, if you like, convert this to degrees if you want to put it in degrees or for the purposes of like if the book asked you to do it and maybe they gave the answer in degrees and you're just, you know, for the purpose of checking, uh, we could convert this to degrees. I get 275 degrees. So we could say it's this or 2 at 275 degrees. I mean, either is okay. I mean, unless I specify use degrees or use radians, if with trigonometric form, you can take your pick. It's only with exponential form that you really got to be in radians. Now, what if I wanted to write this in um, rectangular form? It's going to be R plus. Uh huh. So say that again. Yeah, so like the, the real part is R cosine theta, and the imaginary part is R sine theta. Kind of using that, like thinking of them as our components of vectors, kind of. Uh, which we, could, we can do that by thinking of these as our formulas to get the real and the imaginary parts. We'd have 2 cosine 4.8 and 2 sine 4.8. Just making sure that my, if I'm right, if I'm using the angle in radians, that my calculator needs to be in radian mode when I plug these in. Um, in this chapter, a lot, uh, we have to just be really vigilant about checking the mode that our calculator's in. Um, so we get 
point one seven five and negative two. Negative two. I'm gonna do one one point nine nine because I took the other one to the hundreds uh, to three significant digits. Um, if you're using two significant digits, it would be negative two. So that means that the number is 0.175 minus 1.99j. There it is in rectangular form. You've got to attach the j to the imaginary part. Now, this is sort of how we do it if I'm thinking of the real and the imaginary as components and using these as, um, as a sort of formulas to get those uh, coefficients. You could also do it by, if, I, if you go up here, um, just distribute, right, the way we did before, and you'll multiply. You get exactly the same thing. All right. Ready for another? I'm ready. So... Here we're t they give us a oh well, they give us a complex number in exponential form that we're cubing right so we want to write this out in trigonometric form so they haven't even given us the number itself is the cube of this number so we don't even necessarily have it in the exponential form yet like we don't know what r is or what theta is just yet we totally can figure it out just by using some algebra um, we have a product 1.846 times e to that stuff that's a product that we're cubing. So let's start there. 1.846e to the 0.87j. From our rules of exponents, we know that we can distribute an exponent over a product. So let's do that. So we've got that part down. And obviously, you know, we can use the calculator to cube this out. What about this part? I've got e to, to raise to a power, and then I'm cubing that whole thing. What do the rules of exponents tell me we can do there? Combine the exponents. Split off the 0.87 j. I don't know that we want to split them. I mean, oh, I see what you're saying, like write it as a product, maybe? Okay, yeah. The you would add, well, so if, if we had a product, I see, I think you're thinking about going in the opposite direction. Okay. But I, but I see, but, but I think you've got the right kind of idea. We're raising a power to a power. So we can multiply. So we can multiply them. Yeah. So first of all, 1.846 cubed is 6.291. And then, yeah, we're going to multiply. So we get e to the 3 times 0.87j, or 3 times 0.87, it's 2.61. So here this is, here's the number in um, exponential form. 6.291 at 2.61, or if we want to write it explicitly using using the trigonometric functions, we know 6.291 is cosine 2.61 plus j sine 2.61. And they wanted it in the trig form, so we're pretty much done. That would be fine, too. Um, I want to just observe how kind of simple it was to cube out this number using our rules of exponents. We had it in the exponential form, right? So we said, okay, I'm just going to, I can distribute an exponent over a product. So we could cube the 1.846, and then when we raise a power to a power, we just multiply. And I want you to think about this, and think about how would our approach change to this problem if instead of cubing the 1.846e to the 0.87j, we were raising it to like, I don't know, the 17th power. Like, how much more work would that entail? Not much more, you're just replacing the previous Yeah, 17. right? Now, 
Think about what it would take to cube out a number in rectangular form, boiling, and how much more work would be involved if we were raising it to the 17th power. So this is why it is worthwhile to learn about like how we work with complex numbers in a polar form. Raising something to the third power and raising something to the 17th, it's virtually the same amount of work. It takes the, the exact same amount of work. We're doing the same thing. Um, since we're talking about powers, and, and we're going to work with this a whole lot more next class. Um, and, and maybe this will be just like a little teaser to give you a reason to come back on Wednesday. Um, what we haven't done yet, we haven't really taken any roots of complex numbers. Right? I mean, we've been able to foil things out so we could raise a complex number in rectangular form to like whole number powers. I could square it, I could cube it. If I want to do a whole lot of work, I could, you know, just foil all day long. Oh, that works for the positive whole number values. We can even do negative whole number powers because we know how to do one over. We know how to divide, right, by multiplying by the conjugate. And we can even do large powers, right, using this um, without too much more work, using this polar form. But if I wanted to find, what if, what if, I'm getting so excited right now, uh, I take 1.846, e to the 0.87j, what if I raise that to the one half power? Would that be much more work than what we did before? No. no, in fact, I can't really think of any power I might put on there that would be much more work than just cubing it. But let's just recognize now that we can see, oh, that's not really a big deal, right? We can do that. Essentially what we're saying is, oh, I know how to take a square root of a complex number but just by raising it to the one-half power, right? A square root is a one-half power. Like, have you, have you thought of yet, and if you haven't, you're about to, because I'm going to ask, what is the square root of j? Like, what do I multiply by itself to get j? Like, it ought to exist somewhere. Now we have sort of the means. This is the, the means by which we're going to build upon to um, answer questions like that. Um, so the, net, the last page is just sort of a summary of ways we can express complex numbers. We've got the rectangular form just means like coordinates, right? You have your real part and the imaginary part. That was the first format we saw that these complex numbers express. And then we have a polar form, one of which we might label as trigonometric and one of which we might label as exponential. I don't, you know, my instructions will always read, like if I care about the format, will always just be a distinction between rectangular and polar. I'm not going to make a big distinction between trigonometric and exponential form. They are, for all intents and purposes, the same thing. All right. The 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 important thing to to observe and to take into consideration is that if we're using the exponential form, our angle has to be in radians. So be aware of that. Um, let's do another example. Let's find the rectangular form of the complex number e to the j times pi. So that's an exponential form. Um, what is the value of r in this form? Right, so we're, we're working with a number in this form right here. What is r for us? One, One yep. And what's theta? Pi. Yeah, that's our angle. It's in radians. So e to the j times, if I want to put it in rectangular form, well, I can write it in its like trigonometric form to help me out. Cosine pi plus j sine pi. What's cosine of pi? Negative 1, cosine is the x-coordinate. What's sine of pi? 0. So we get negative 1. We have e to the j times pi is negative 1. That's a pretty famous fact and, and beloved fact. In fact, it is much more, um, you're more likely to see this equation written in the following form. If we simply add 1 to both sides, 
we get e to the j pi plus 1 equals 0. Um, this is called Euler's identity. There's like a million, di Euler was such a prolific mathematician, um, like 18th century mathematician, I think. He was such a prolific mathematician that if you look up Euler's formula, you're going to see like five different results come up because he just had a hand in like every area of mathematics, pretty much. Um, here's, here's one of his most famous. It is one of the most powerful equations in all of mathematics, and, and, and I'll tell you a couple ways to think of this. In all of mathematics, there are five like fundamental important numbers, and they are zero and one, right? The zero and the unit, and then e and pi and j. And here's like a super simple looking equation that relates them all together. There's no like apparent reason why that should just happen, but it does. And um, another way to think of it is I take so e and pi, they're, they're not only irrational, they're transcendental, which just means they're super fucked up, OK? And then and j is imaginary. So I take this messed up number, and I raise it to this imaginary messed up number, and I get negative 1, which is a totally normal number. Um, and that should be enough to, you know, curl your socks a little bit. <laughs>